yesterday we um, spoke a little bit about error correction. And, uh, and I said that the main point was, was the following. You can always write a general error as, as the state of your system times some environment. And we've seen all sorts of environments with many qubits, uh, um, harmonic oscillators, if you like, or, or whatever is the nature of the environment. And, and then I said, effectively, if you think of the whole thing as a unitary transformation, then you can always break this. I mean, this actually is the same as the, as the isomorphism between completely positive maps and what I call the higher Hilbert space representation of the whole thing. So there is some kind of unitary transformation now, which couples the system and the, and the environment. And you can always write this as a, as a bunch of different effects on the system, each corresponding to a different state of the environment. So it's something like this. Uh, um, let's call it EI, which only acts on the system itself. Um, Psi s, so this is the, the new state of, of your system. I did a single qubit expansion and I showed you that these EIs become sigma x, sigma y, and sigma z. But, uh, but you can have a more general error, if you like, with more qubits, and it always looks something like this. So this guy is an operator that acts on the state, changes the state, but the environment always looks at, uh, uh, basically always records the change. And you've got to have that. Because, because otherwise it's difficult to have a unitary transformation of this type. Um, so the whole thing is nice and unitary, but the problem for us is that um, we, do not have, um, we do not have any information about the environment. So at this stage you trace out the environment, if you like, and that's the general problem of error correction. Uh, you trace the environment out, and what you get, of course, is a mixture, as we know, is a CP map. Um, and the question is, can you now invert this kind of, uh, this kind of guy? And, and what I said is that in order to invert, you've got to have the information within the system itself as to which of these E's uh, has happened. So not only does your environment encode that, but part of your system, which we are going to destroy just to measure it and to recover the initial state, has to also record it. So basically, I want to go back to this now, deterministically. And the only way, I mean, in general, I cannot do this, obviously. But if I have some redundancy that S itself is composed of, of, the, of the thing that I, that, I, that I want to protect, uh, Okay, some prime, and then there is an extra bit m i, which so this s, if you like, has two parts. One is the real bit carrying information originally, could be single qubit if you like. The rest is what I call the syndrome, some kind of memory that also tags the environment and understands which of the errors has happened. And if I have this extra information then I can always do some kind of controlled gate, conditional on the value of this guy, I invert this operator E. Okay, I apply E to minus one, if you like. And if I have this information, I can always do that. So now, in this way, we arrive at the quantum humming bound, because the question was, how big does this guy have to be? If I have a certain number of errors, uh, if, if I want to protect k qubits, and this will be something like n minus k qubits. And I allow eta errors. The question is, what is the size of this guy so that I make sure that each of these guys, each of the errors goes into an orthogonal state? Okay? Because if, if, if they are not orthogonal, <coughs> then I cannot discriminate them by making measurements. I'm being a little bit too general. Actually, you, you do have the generous in it, and, and I think it's fine even, even if, if you cannot discriminate the pool. Okay, so this is general error correction. Now, um, one interesting case, you, you can ask yourself, I've been talking too much. Um, you can ask yourself what happens if I want to protect entanglement in this way. Um, can I do that? 
And the answer, of course, is yes, you can. So, so basically, again, due to linearity of quantum mechanics, you don't have to worry about, um, about collective protection. As long as each of your qubits is individually protected. This is because this guy, EI, always looks in some basis, but I think we use the sigma Pauli matrix basis, always looks like a product of sigmas. <coughs> so this will be something like sigma 1i1, one one, you know, see, I'm going to invent something very complicated as a notation, but it looks like that. I index is just each of these i's could be either x, y, or z, or in fact identity, if you like. So in each of these qubits, and, and this is a full basis, I span all two to the n possible, um, well, four to the n. Each of them is a four, four possibilities, three Pauli operators and an identity. And this spans all possible things that can happen to n qubits. So once I know how to deal with one of them individually, I'm going to be able to do it collectively as well. I'll show you a very nice example of that now. So you don't have to, you don't have to worry about, oh, I can protect each of the qubits, but what about the correlations within qubits? Because of, because of linearity, somehow it's already taken care of within this picture. So here is a very nice example of protecting entanglement. Um, so you start, you start with the state 0, 0, plus 1, 1, let's say. It's going to be an interesting example because you will, you will think halfway through the example that I'm doing something that's not possible. This is going to be like an entangled version of, of what we call Maxwell's demon. It seems that, that I'll be doing something that I shouldn't be able to do. Uh, and what I'll be violating is, the, is, the, is what I said was the, the entanglement version of the second law, that you cannot increase entanglement by local means. Now I'm going to increase it, okay, for you, just to show you how this, this can be done. So what I, what I want to do, and without loss of generality, I'm going to encode the Bob side. So imagine now you say, I want to protect an entangled state. And I know that Bob's qubit can decohere, deface, whatever else you like. Um, and, and now Bob, you can do the same for Alice. Alice can locally encode. But if you just see how it goes for Bob, it's the same thing. So basically, what I add is two zeros initially, but both on Bob's side. This is all basically Bob. So Alice and Bob share this entangled pair, if you like. And on top of it, Bob brings two qubits here, and now he's going to do some kind of encoding, and the decoding and errors you know, are going to happen and so on. Um, and, and you remember from, from, from yesterday that, let's say that sigma x is the error. It's going to be exactly the same story for any other error. So what he would do is he would do something like uh, 0, 0, 0, 0. So basically, these three zeros are all on Bob's side. Because he can do a control knot and another. This is a local operation and another control knot. So basically, they have a state like that. And now an error takes place. I just want to show you that entanglement is also protected. Uh, an error takes place, and now you have a mixture. If you think about this as as um, probability, there is a probability that nothing happens to this state. Uh, so it's going to be the state itself. Let's call this state psi. Okay, so this guy is some state psi. So there is a probability that nothing happens. And then let's say that there is a probability that one of these bits on Bob's side has flipped. And I'm going to call this like psi 1, psi 2, or psi 3, depending on I should probably call it psi, so depending on whether the first, the second, or the third guy has flipped. Okay? So here is the state after the error has happened. 1 minus p, psi 1. Let's say it's the same probability for each of these two flips, which kind of makes sense. Psi 2 plus psi 3. Okay? So the first, here nothing happens. Here, this psi 1 is the state where the second, this qubit, the first qubit on both sides is flipped. So it looks like that. Plus 1, 0, 1, 1. And then, you know, psi 2 looks like 0, 0, 1, 0, and 1, 1, 0, 1, and so on. Okay, so that's, that's basically 
So I have a mixture of four different states, each of which is a maximally entangled state of its own. Uh, and, and we obtained it by, by some kind of noise. And now I follow the protocol that I, that I described yesterday, which says just decode the whole thing. So the error has happened somewhere here, and I've got all four possible states. Then I decode here, then I measure the syndrome if you like, and then I error correct. And I know that I can do this with perfect efficiency in this case, and I know I'm going to restore the original state of this qubit. Uh, so if I, if I do the error correction, I'm going to go back, um, so decode um, plus uh, correct. And, and what I'm going to get is I'm going to get the initial state of this type, 0, 0, plus 1, 1. So if you can protect any general state psi, then you can also protect anything that this is entangled to. Okay? If I can protect 0 and 1, uh, then I can certainly protect 0, 0, plus 1, 1. That's kind of the message, right? Because, because I can do each of, of these guys, and that's the point here. Uh, but what's unusual about this, and I think it takes you probably a few seconds to realize that there is nothing funny about it. What's unusual about this is that here I've got a mixed state. Presumably less entangled than a maximally entangled state. This is a pure state. This is maximally entangled. So I've started with a maximally entangled state. I've got an error. I go to a less entangled state, presumably, which is mixed. Then I do error correction, and I go back to the maximally entangled state. But my error correction is a local operation. It doesn't act on the other guy. So it seems that local operations can create a pure state out of a mixed state. They can increase entanglement. How can that be? Okay. Any thoughts about that? Any ideas how to resolve this? Yeah, it's Say it again on average. What? Sorry. On average, I get on average I get one unit at the end, one full unit. I recover exactly the state that I started. Deterministic. No average in this case. The initially zero zero becomes mixed state. Yes, so this state here is a mixed state. Yes. This guy is now a mixed state because I've traced out the environment. I no longer care about the environment. So I so I'm getting rid of this guy already and I'm saying I don't really care what the probability for error is. Whatever it is, it's gonna be some kind of mixed state, even if it's a small, small probability. You're just passing the element around the environment and then back to the other state. Yes, so I was I was I was cheating a little bit. This mixed state is as entangled as the pure state, actually. And that's one of the messages. A mixed state can be as entangled as a pure state. This guy contains exactly one unit of entanglement. You didn't lose any entanglement. So you in a way you just reshuffled it around. But because I can discriminate locally each of these states, I actually have the same amount of entanglement that I started with. You know, this is a little bit like me saying, look, I'm giving you this state, or I'm giving you state uh, 2, 2 plus 3, 3, and I'm mixing them. And then I say, look, I mixed them, I lost entanglement. But you didn't, because they live in completely different subspaces. I can discriminate them. I can tell you whether I live in the 2, 3 subspace or in 0, 1. And that's error correction for you. So I've said somehow this is a mixed state and therefore has to be less entangled, but it's in fact as entangled as the original one. So error correction preserves entanglement as well. That's the message of this. There's nothing unusual about it. it looks a little bit like Maxwell's demon that you're creating more order than, than you ought to be able to, but, but there is no problem. Yeah, it's an interesting, it's an interesting case. So anyway, in this case you can you can correct all of these things. Now, what can happen? Is that, so now I'm going to go into, into the direction of, of um, do we always have to encode with extra qubits? And, and can it be that uh, some things we, uh, we don't need to encode at all? And there are many, many ideas there. I think the two most prominent ones are uh, decoherence-free subspaces and topological 
quantum computation. So I'll mention them very briefly. At some stage, this is also this is also linked to the to the topic of trying to use noise for creative purposes, and I think I'll go into that in a minute. Uh, for those of you for those of you who, who know a little bit about quantum optics, you will know that when when n two level atoms um, are decaying into the into the electromagnetic path, then it's very important which regime. They, uh, they exist in, in the sense of how, what is the frequency, in this case probably nicer to speak about the wavelength of the, of the mode into which they all decay. For example, if they decay, if each of these guys emits light of, 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 uh, of uh, wavelength and these wavelengths don't overlap with each other, then you could imagine that each of them sees its own path and somehow the decay rate is independent. So in a sense, what I said yesterday, if each of them has e to the minus gamma t decay rate, then n of them will just independently multiply the factor. So the state e, 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 if you like, will go down at the three times the decay rate. But there is a regime in which this is not true. And, and the regime is when, of course, in the, in, in the other extreme, when, when they all emit, for example, the, 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 the frequency which is the same, or, highly similar, if you like. In which case, it's not clear when an emission happens. It's not clear which of the atoms has emitted. The other one really gives you information. You know, if I put detectors here, then if I get a click in the first detector, I know that the first atom must have emitted, because I know the range, uh, the window in which this guy does uh, emit. But if they all emit very broad uh, wavelength light, then if I get a click now, I really don't have a clue which of the atoms clicked. And you can see that this is going to lead to some kind of enhancement. And the two regimes are the super and sub radiance. Super radiance is something that goes as n squared. Um, so basically, you could, have, you could have a rate which goes as something like n squared gamma t. So somehow they constructively interfere now when they emit and this enhances the rate of this decay. Think of them coupling to, a, to the same coherent state with the amplitude n, and the mod square of that is n squared. That's physically roughly where the n squared comes from, when they all couple to the same mode. The other extreme is when they actually don't emit at all. All of these amplitudes cancel negatively out, so basically this guy emits with a positive phase, this guy with a negative, positive, negative, positive, negative. There is an even number, you know, pluses and minuses, and basically you get zero decay rate. That's called the subradiance. They don't radiate at all. This is well known in, in optics. And now the question is, does that, you know, actually the decoherence-free subspace is just a fancy name coming from, from quantum information uh, that's given to exactly this phenomenon here subradiance, how to suppress emission of radiation because of collective uh, effects of these atoms. So let, let me just show you a, a simple example of that. Um, you can do this, uh, you can just check this for yourself. A typical example is really just to take a three-level atom uh, and to say something like, uh, I've got two levels of this atom. Um, like, uh, I don't know, A and B. And I've got a ground level C. And now, if you, if you have a system where the, it's just the easiest to see, they don't have to be the same. But imagine that there is some rate of decay here, and then imagine that there is another rate of decay from the other side. Say they're the same rate of decay, just to make it very simple. Then, then what's going to happen is that if you prepare this state um, as some kind of difference of the A minus B state, then, uh, then what, what will happen is that, is that basically the state will be the so-called dark state. It's never going to emit because the state doesn't change in time when you apply the decay rate that's the same decay rate. So it's a state that's fixed. If, if, if you prepare your qubit in this state, up there, if the electron is sitting somewhere here with this space, then you're never going to get a spontaneous emission. And that's kind of a simple example of that. When you talk about two qubits, um, 
and each of them somehow emitting, the analog of this state would be would be the state if each of them is like zero and one as usual. The analog would be some kind of singlet state. So basically, whatever happens to one here, it's going to happen in the same way to one over here. The whole thing is just going to factor out. It's not going to affect the state at all. So it doesn't matter if one goes into e to the i phi one because the same thing happens on both sides, and so your state remains invariant. It never evolves. It's a fixed state. The singlet is a dark state of the system. So in a way, it's very good for quantum memory, but you always face the same issue when you talk about uh, quantum computation, because you can say now, it's very nice, it doesn't evolve, but how do, I, how do I compute with this state? And of course, you cannot compute with this state. You have to change the state, and that leads you frequently back to, to the same problem. However, there is one interesting thing to do with it. So in a way, it's a good memory, but if you want to, if you want to change this to some other state, then you, may have a, then you may have a problem. So for example, you may want to couple two atoms of this type. And this guy also exists in some kind of uh, coherent superposition. But now if you want some control gate between these two, so if you want to create something like A, A, minus B, B, or whatever you want to create, this state, of course, is no longer a dark state. It's not a product of the original states, and now the whole thing is susceptible to, to noise. So you always have the same problem. It's very similar to the cavity that I said. You put a cavity around your atom, you eliminate all the channels of decay like that. But actually, what you do then is, is just isolate your system fully from anything else. And there's always a trade-off between these guys. Now, there is one interesting way of applying this, even though, even though it may be a problem. And the way is really to use this kind of effect to create entanglement. Because we know that, so can we use noise to create entanglement? And once we have entanglement, maybe we can do something more interesting with that. Um, and in fact, there is a model uh, uh, of computation, and you, you know about it, it's called cluster state computation, where basically all the effort goes into establishing the initial cluster state. I think I'll talk about it in the, in the last week of the course much more. And once you have the cluster state, then you only have to make measurements. You don't have to do anything else. So in a sense, if I could use this noise not to compute, but to establish the initial entanglement, maybe then everything is nice anyway. And now I just do the measurements, which are noisy anyway, so I don't have to worry too much about it. That's the logic. I mean, it sounds very good. It sounds probably too good to be true, and it is too good to be true. There are problems with that as well. But it, it's an interesting idea. Imagine the following scenario. People talk seriously about these things. Imagine a two-level atom now inside the cavity. So I control the atom very well, uh, and the atom can exchange, let's say the atom is on resonance with the cavity. So one of the modes of the cavity is exactly the same frequency as the transition frequency of this atom. And imagine I've got another, another guy like that, um, somewhere here, okay, so there's a two-level atom, and, and again, you know, excited and ground and so on. Um, and the cavity itself can leak. Um, this is actually a very difficult experiment. It's been proposed. It's been accepted by PRLs and sciences as well as a proposal. But I think it's a very, very difficult one to achieve in practice. Um, however, imagine, entertain, entertain yourself with this idea that you can couple a fiber to this cavity. And you've got another fiber from this cavity. Um, and basically, you've got some kind of uh, some kind of beam splitter here, I suppose, uh, of these two guys, and you've got some detectors here. Okay. Um, people make these um, fibers; they glue them together, and all sorts of things actually are done it this way. So that, that's not that's not difficult. What's difficult is to make sure that when this guy goes down. And, and emits a photon to the cavity, and you want the photon to really go into the fiber with as high efficiency as possible. And people propose this because we think that ultimately, like I said, you may be able to hold 10 ions within one location in a cavity like that. But if you want a large quantum computer, you have to have something like 10 of these cavities, and all of them have to be connected. Because if you don't have entanglement between these cavities, then your quantum computer is not going to be powerful anyway. 
so it, it's no good having lots of adductors of 10 atoms and another independent bunch of 10 atoms and another. It's not going to give you any advantage of a classical form. So you, you need to exploit the overall entanglement. And so this is something that people think may, may be possible one day. Now, imagine that this, so these two atoms are now prepared in the excited state and they are completely disentangled themselves. To start with, they are very far apart, but the fibers are connected. So now imagine that they emit a photon, the photons enter the fibers. And what I'm doing here, so you know, if I was to detect a photon anywhere here before, the, before this final junction, I could tell, if I get a click here, I know that this guy emitted a photon. And if I get a click from this guy, I know that, uh, I know that this guy emitted a photon. But if I mix these guys with a beam splitter, that's a little bit like creating a very broad um, wavelength light, which means I'm really confusing these two possibilities of the beam splitter. So if I get a click in, in the detector here, I don't know whether the click is coming from this direction or that direction. Okay? So what this means, I mean, you know that this requires super efficient timing that these two parts are of the same length and all the other things to, to erase the possible information in the environment. But in the, in the, in the nicest case uh, scenario, what you will get is either one of these detectors will click or the other one, in which case you are left with two possibilities. Either the state is EG plus GE or EG minus GE. And you know which one's which because one of them corresponds to this guy and one, the other one to the other guy, just like any other interferometer. So in a sense, now what I'm doing is I'm using noise I'm using noise in a controlled way because, because I'm still saying this leaks out, but I can kind of get it to come to here. But what I've done is I've used this kind of spontaneous emission from the cavity to get two atoms to be entangled. And now if I can keep doing that and establish a larger network of atoms, I've got a hugely entangled state, and this is something that we know we can compute with even by just doing measurements. So the, the question is, can I do that? So you see, it doesn't matter that this is probabilistic because I'm going to just repeat until I succeed. And when I succeed, I've got one unit of entanglement, perfectly insulated. They are, they are sitting in cavities. If I, if I make this mirror completely reflecting, I'm, I'm never going to get any other decay outside. Um, so that's an, interesting, that's an interesting idea how to try, uh, how to, try to do this kind of, uh, this kind of stuff. Um, People do this already uh, with things like quantum dots as well. So they have uh, two quantum dots in two different pillars. The quantum dots emit light, and because again the wavelength doesn't give you any information about which of them emits, you can have, a, you can have exactly the EG plus minus GE state from two quantum dots. So people are doing this in all sorts of solid state or solid state implementations. Um, okay, now. Another thing to talk about, so this is, this is more like static protection, but it comes for free. That's the idea here. The spontaneous emission is there. You cannot prevent it. But why not try to, to erase the information about where it comes from, and that's going to give you entanglement in your systems. And that's something you, you actually can exploit. So for example, if you could do this, you can already see how you can teleport information from one of these photons via this atom to the other cavity. So once you have this successfully done, you're OK. You can do information processing, no problem. Um, the other direction is, can, can I control the dynamics of my system better? What if I was to do the dynamics? And then topological quantum computation, intuitively speaking, is an idea that merges both of these together. So can I have a good stable memory but also, as I change and, and apply gates to my memory, can I also make sure that these gates are stable? And I think this goes a little bit back to this idea that I described very briefly, which is to do with, uh, with, uh, with some kind of topological phases. So imagine, imagine, imagine if all of my gates are based on some kind of phases that are, broadly speaking, independent of the geometry of my system, but only depend on some uh, topological feature of this guy. So, so the, the, the first idea of this slide was due to a Heimer and Bond, 
who said, imagine I have some kind of magnetic field, and imagine I have, um, I have a solenoid around. I mean, in some abstract sense, you can think of uh, doing a double slit experiment with an electron around, around this guy. And you can say, well, I send this electron one way, or I send this electron the other way. This is an interferometer. And then I ask myself, what happens here? You know, is this guy going to be detected here or here? You know? And this is, this is done under all sorts of, basically, usually you, you use some kind of uh, superconductor and uh, with a hole inside, uh, like a Josephson junction, I suppose, and you, you do some, some kind of experiment like that. And the idea, the idea is now, um, uh, here is like a Hadamard gate where I split my electron into two possible parts. This now is a phase gate of, of my electron. So what happens is that uh, if you think of the up path and the down path, okay, that's the state here. What happens, what happens is these guys go go around this uh, uh, magnetic field is that they get equal phases but of opposite signs and if you calculate the total phase it really is just equal to the flux of this magnetic field so it's u plus e to the i flux this is just the b times the area uh, times down and so when you come out this way depending on the flux you will either get a click here or here okay it's the usual interferometer now why why is this a possible stable gate? So modular the fact that I'm not sure if I can control the electronic parts well and so on. Um, can, I, can I ignore all of these things and still make this phase stable? And the answer is this is stable as long as your magnetic field is really confined to a very small area. And that's what it means to be topological. It doesn't really matter what happens outside of this B field because the flux only depends on the area here. So if I can confine my magnetic field to a small area, imagine you don't have a good control of the path of the electron. Imagine there's an environment disturbing the electron. So the electron does this, okay, and this guy does that. Who cares? It's exactly the same phase that the guy gains. My gate is fully independent of the geometry of what happens, okay? So I can shake it as much as I like, and I'm still going to get the exact same number at the end of this. And, and of course, um, this sounds very appealing. Um, so, so, um, so, yeah, what's the problem there? Well, um, um, of course, first problem is, can you, if, you know, if, if I'm already talking about losing control, then can I really make sure that they come back to the same point and interfere? So it can't be that I really lose absolutely all the control because then I then I can no longer interfere them and so on. So what what uh, few people did is they really suggested uh, to use these kind of phases, so they're known as geometrical phases in general, uh, as as some kind of intrinsic error correcting mechanism. So if you can if you can to, to a high degree remain independent. Of, of what happens to the system, then you have a very robust gate. And I think I already talked about the block sphere and, uh, and, um, and the state of your system evolving in some, in some sense. I think I was describing a rotation of this type where certain area is enclosed. And now the argument is that if your noise is in some way very symmetric, and if you, you don't quite describe this area, but you describe something like that, it doesn't matter. It's not going to be reflected in your face. Because all of these, all of the times when you are outside of this guy, will cancel to the first approximation with the guys here, and you will be left exactly with the same phase that you want to implement. So that's kind of the topological idea of a of a gate. Um, and you can do control dynamics in this way as well, because what you can now imagine is that there is another another system here, which naturally couples to this guy. <laughs> so that the area that this guy executes depends on the state of this system. This would happen to two spins, for example, in, in NMI. And in fact, this is what, this is the one experiment that was implemented quite some time ago. So basically, if this guy is in the state up, you get one area. If it's in the state down, this spin points in a different direction and executes something else. You can do a control mod gate and so on. And the question, and I think I'm going to make a break now, but the question that I want to, that I want to address when we return is what kind of elements would I need now to, to ensure that this, that this is always fine? And you will see that it, engage, it involves some kind of degeneracy. 
So we're trying to tick as many boxes as possible as far as robustness is concerned. But you will see that ultimately this is actually something that's still very difficult to achieve. So I think lots of people are, are after topological ways of error correction, but I think we still don't have a system that would be good enough to support something like that. So I want to do that in the next part. And then I want to conclude, because this is really the end of the first part, I want to, I want to become a little bit more philosophical. Uh, and, uh, and I want to talk a little bit about the other direction, which are, which are completely neglected, but I think now is the time to come back to it. And this direction is the one of deriving quantum physics from information. I want to go the other way. I've been claiming all the time that the laws of physics um, influence mathematics, and that's the right direction, and I still think it is. But I want to now invert this and go against my own uh, principles and, and tell you whether you can derive quantum mechanics from information. How much would it take? I'll tell you about some of these efforts to understand quantum mechanics. They're also very exciting. So let's make a 10 minute break. Just wrap up the, the topological idea, and, um, and then we switch to the second part. Um, uh, the, the way that this started is, is with another um, really neat idea. So wishful thinking of the following type. Imagine I have a bunch of indistinguishable particles. Um, like imagine I have a bunch of electrons, um, and uh, and they're sitting in some kind of array in some state. Now, um, I know that when I exchange two electrons, I will get a, a negative, a pi, base shift because they are fermions, so the function has to be anti-symmetrous, if you like. So I can think of these guys as, uh, as basically swapping places, which is the same as one of them going around the other one fully, if you like. And, and this can give you a minus, a minus phase shift. And, and so now you're saying, well, I've got some kind of, I've got some kind of um, <coughs> conditional, conditional phase gate. Uh, you will remember that, that if you are able to do uh, this transformation, in a way, th th this transformation is as powerful as a control knot. It looks very weak, actually. All you're doing is just a minus sign in front of one of the components. But in the plus minus basis, this looks like a control knot. So if you look at this basis in the in this uh, gate in this basis, then uh, then nothing happens to these guys. But plus minus um, probably I should say when this is plus okay when this is plus minus goes to plus, and when this is plus this plus goes into minus okay something like that. So it's a C knot gate, and this is C phase. So C phase is the same as C naught, providing provided you are able to switch from zero to plus and one to minus a Hadamard gate. Yeah. So C phase plus Hadamard two Hadamards is a C naught. It's equally powerful. Um, and that's the you know that's the bare minimum. If you can do some kind of minus sign in front of one of these elements, and you don't do anything to the other ones, you have actually a universal quantum computer. Modulo that you should be able to do a little bit more than this. You should be able to do some general superposition like that, general rotation, and then you've got a you've got a universal set of gates. So then, wouldn't it be nice if I go to this array of electrons, which are in some initial state, whatever it is, plus 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 plus. I start swapping them around, and they start gaining minus signs, much as in this way. And suddenly, I can execute Grover's search algorithm just by moving them around. I mean, that would be cool, of course. It would be even better if I could just myself move around and get a phase there. But of course, that's not very easy to uh, imagine. Um, anyhow, the, the, the idea is not, not all that crazy in many ways. Um, uh, but what you're missing, even if you could do this, what you're always missing is a gate that's going to execute this creating a superposition. And you can see that if all I'm giving you is some kind of phase gate, um, so basically I'm able to execute something like that, 
then it's very difficult to imagine a control not entangling gate because I, you know, for me to entangle, I need to be able to create the first qubit, let's say, in a superposition, and I need to be able now to do some kind of controlled operation. But this guy is a must. Unless I can do this, I, I can't execute the most general computation. And this, you cannot do as a phase. It's just not one of those operations. So it's clear that I have to do a little bit more. And actually, what you really need now is, is something that people call a non-abelian phase. So there are many ways of talking about it. There are more physical ways and less physical ways. But what people are saying is, imagine if, if I had particles, which when they exchange um, states, so here is two states, and I want to go into some phi psi state. The phase that, that comes out is not just a normal phase, like plus or minus one, you know, zero or pi, as would be for, for, for fermions or bosons. But imagine that this phase is some kind of a matrix that allows me to move within this subspace as well. So, so this now, this would be some kind of a some kind of a two by two matrix, if you like. Imagine if I could do that. So first of all, there's a big question in physics, are there particles like that? They're called anions, and not just anions. Anions would be a particle that has any phase there. But non-abelian means that the phase itself is a matrix. It's not just a number. So that means if I do one thing followed by another thing, these two phases don't commute. I can't reverse this to, to get the same result. Normal phases commute. And you can see that these guys commute with each other. That's why I can't do a, a, a flip, a big flip. But actually, if I have something that doesn't commute in this sense, then I could really do universal quantum computation in this way. And now you say, are there aliens in, in, in this universe, non-abelian aliens? And the answer is, we have no idea. Uh, there, is, there is a guess that one of these fractional quantum Hall effect states is really made up of these non-abelian aliens, but no one knows even how to describe this properly. People argue whether this is really a non-abelian anion, and even if it is a non-abelian anion, you have to now try to swap these guys around and compute with that. So we have no idea whether this is going to be possible. But what is possible is to try to simulate this behavior and get non-abelian gates in normal, in normal systems. All you need is some kind of degeneracy. So I want to show you how this now starts to combine the idea of a robust memory on top of robust dynamics and putting it together to give you something that's intrinsically fault tolerant. Okay? In, in the same way that it's a very appealing idea, just like you know, replication of DNA is intrinsically fault tolerant, we argue that classical computers are intrinsically fault tolerant now anyway. It would be nice to say there is something in nature that also makes a quantum computer fault on. I don't have to do all the work that I've been, that I've been doing. Degeneracy is nice, first of all, because if you encode your qubit in these two levels, if they are really very close in energy, then there won't be any rate of emission or hopping between them. So the, you know, the probability for this guy to move here is, is effectively zero, unless there is some kind of, of course, interaction allowing it to, to couple to this level and then go down to this level. Okay? So now I've got at least a stable memory. This is very much what ion trappers do. They use um, levels that are very clo close to each other energetically speaking. And so that's the, the, the most stable configuration. But now you say, okay, um, if you now try to execute some kind of geometrical phase of this type, what you will see is that you're moving into a degenerate subspace. And you'll be simultaneously acting on both of these states. And in fact, the most general adiabatic evolution, if you like, the one leading to the geometric phase, will now be a rotation in the two-dimensional subspace of this type. So if you really think of the state 0 and state 1, and you solve the Schrodinger equation for this guy jointly, so it's going to be something like that and you change your Hamiltonian very slowly to rotate in this subspace, you will really, you can really write the phase gate of this type as, a, as an SU2 unitary matrix. So the generous is the thing that leads, that upgrades normal phases into, into these matrices phases, non-abelian phases. So, so first of all, I have a control of my system that it's not going to emit because it's always sitting in this decoherence-free subspace, if you like. And secondly, 
now if I start to move around this subspace, but then you can say, how do you move around? And that's the tricky bit always in these in this, in this schemes. The way I move around is that I'm going to shine some light, which is so far of resonance with this level, that the chances of me exciting are very low. It's important that this is the case, because otherwise, of course, if I'm up there with a unit probability, I'm going to lose all my population at some stage. And I can do the same here. So effectively, this is something that opticians, again, call the adiabatic elimination. I can completely even ignore this guy from my Hamiltonian and write the resulting evolution just in this subspace here. So it's as if something excites it to here and then de it to there. And I can write fully the evolution with the full Schrodinger equation in the subspace. And you will see that it's going to be a very, so first of all, you're doing it adiabatically. It's very robust. And secondly, there's a degeneracy. There is no spontaneous emission on top of it. Um, so this would, be, this would be a kind of robust way of, uh, this was proposed by Bruce Shore a long time ago, actually, not even within the context of quantum information, uh, just within the context of geometric phases. And so now you, you could argue that we have something that's a little bit more robust to noise. Uh, and, and now you say, OK, I'm going to start putting these guys together and having another cube. You, you see that you always are, of course, talking about redundancy. I think the scheme that I'm describing here really requires two extra levels, one for each of these transitions. So you can see that I'm usually adding another qubit to protect my qubit at least. Um, and, and of course, now the question is, you know, how big is your degenerate subspace? Because ideally, you'd like to have as much degeneracy as the number of qubits that you would like to have there. And then you'd like to be able to excite them by some other levels, but without really exciting these other levels. And you can see already that there is a trade-off there. Because no matter how slow you are, you can't be infinitely slow, because that means you're not going to do anything. No matter how slow you are, there's always some probability that you're going to go out there, even if it's of the second order. And now second orders are going to add each other up as you keep doing computation. And at some stage, there will still be some kind of limitation to this kind of model. So no matter how robust it is, I mean, it's a cute idea because it combines all of these ideas together. Topological phases plus the coherence free subspaces. But of course, it's still a question of, of what exactly, you know, what is the capacity of this kind of dynamics in the real system? And I think this is a very, very, very interesting field and very much alive. Okay, so I'm going to stop here because there's a lot more to be said. Uh, and uh, probably it's best to read about these ideas in literature. Now, um, I think Preskill's notes, I would say, are the best ones on topological, um, topological uh, quantum computation. I don't really encourage you to read Kitab's paper because I don't think I know anyone who understands that paper. Uh, once I went to Caltech and I said to John, "Can I meet? Um, uh, can I meet Kitab and speak to him directly to to explain to me the paper?" Because that's the way I understand things. I usually talk to people directly. And John said, I doubt that it will help even if you speak. <laughs> so his communication skills are equally bad on paper or in practice. Anyhow, it's a great idea. And I think it really keeps much of quantum computing alive. Now, I think it would be very appropriate if I finish this part of the course without telling you about, about these ideas. Because I talked a lot about the connections between information and physics. And the whole point was that information gets changed once you change physics. So that was the, the opposite direction arrow. But there is a, a, large, a large fraction of people in, in the field are really worried about this direction here. In the sense, so the driving motivation is that most physicists, I would say, are very displeased with, with, the, with the rules of quantum mechanics. <coughs> you saw them. You saw them when we wrote them down. They're very abstract. They've got some kind of uh, complex uh, vector space known as the Hilbert space to represent my states. And, and you know, if you contrast this to the, to the first postulate of relativity, that all the laws of physics are the same in all the frames of reference, then they, they're not equally beautiful. I mean, it's clear to all physicists that relativity is phrased in a very simple and intuitively obvious way. Quantum mechanics is anything but, but intuitive at that level. And you know, then you've got some emission operators and you've got some uh, CT maps and so on. So it's, it's not really, the, the axioms are not as nice as, as most of other theories that we have. Um, another favorite um, 
example of other volatility <coughs> is, uh, is thermodynamics in the sense that, in the sense that, um, that again, there we have like two or three laws which are phrased in a very physical way. So, you know, whatever you do, you cannot do that. Okay, you cannot uh, create energy out of nothing. You cannot reduce the entropy of, uh, of an isolated system, and so on. These are very, these are very physical statements. It's clear what they mean and why they should mean what they mean. And after some time, you buy them very readily. But somehow, the Hilbert space axioms are very difficult to buy, uh, to buy on their own. And and the search is on in, in many ways. It's been on for a long time actually to find something that underpins. Hilbert space form formulation. And, and, and the hope is that as we understand these connections between information and physics, maybe we get to see this somehow emerge. I think this would be very nice. You've got all sorts of crazy ideas out there. Category theories, for example, and so on. I think, the, I think it's, it's just a very much a live field. But what's interesting is the following. So I'll tell you, I'll, I'll tell you about <coughs> probably two or three different attempts, which, which are to me interesting. Um, how to how to try to find something deeper? Um, I think Rovelli was the first person who produced something that I that I like. There's an Italian quantum gravity person called Carlo Rovelli, who basically who basically really tried to mimic relativity. And and why relativity? Because quantum mechanics and relativity are very similar theories. You give me a system. I have to make it relativistically compliant. You give me a system, I also have to make it compliant with quantum mechanics. So these are the so-called meta-theories, they are languages. Anything in this world has to speak these languages. Okay? They are not the same theories as other uh, theories in physics we have. So basically everything has to be quantized and everything has to be relativized if that word exists in the English language. But that's, that's the logic. Okay? Give me classical mechanics. I make it relativistic and I make it quantum. Okay? So these are really languages that you have to speak independently of whatever you have to describe. We don't know whether these are the only two languages, but as so far they are the languages. So Ravelli said, why don't I try to give you two very intuitive postulates um, that he tried to, to then argue would lead to quantum mechanics. So the, so the tricky bit is deriving a superposition. It's okay having distinguishable states and talking about two different states and having bits and so on. But the tricky bit is to argue why do I have a, what is the principle forcing me to, to go into different bases? And once you get that, you, you have everything else in government and so on. So his, his first postulate, you will see that this is very, I mean, this is a semi-philosophical paper. Of course, he cannot really derive it like that, but it's, it's a nice attempt. And I'll tell you about two other nice attempts. To understand, so he said something like, "I think the first, the first, um, the first postulate is really like like the whole of Obama, saying that uh, two-level system, um, whatever this is, of course. I mean, so somehow you have to have these guys in your theory. Um, can at most have one bit of entropy of information. So." You know, this is kind of almost a, a defining postulate also of what, a, of, of what a bit is. So it's not clear, is this an axiom, is this an assumption, or is this really something that's a tautology? So, so I'm not really trying to be, to be completely precise and doing reverse. The second postulate is the interesting one. Because now, now we're waiting for something counterintuitive to come along. Because it's got to be weird, right? So I can't give you a nice postulate out there. It has to be something that sounds like a, like a logical impossibility. So he says, even uh, when you have um, max information about the system, you can still get more. Great, like a Zen coin, you know, the Zen statements that make no sense, but you have to sit under a tree for a long time, and suddenly you click, or someone hits you with a stick, and you reach Nirvana, or whatever else you reach. You can always get more. So how can I get more if I'm already the maximum? Doesn't make sense, huh? Um, and of course, you know what this means. It means if in one basis, this forces me to go into the complementary basis. If in one basis, I know that my state is spin up, that means I have maximum information. I've got one bit. 
how can I get more information? By flipping the basis. I can ask a different question in which I have no information, and I can still gain one bit of information. Okay, that's the number two guy. So the first guy tells you I have two level systems in this universe, and I'm going to comprise everything of that. The second guy says information behaves in a funny way. In a funny way, you can always get more, even if you reach the capacity of your system. And now he says this is very similar to uh, the laws of relativity, for example. I don't know if you buy that or not, but there's a very beautiful paper of his, uh, at least 10 years old, on the archive about these issues. Um, two more attempts. Um, so Rovelli would say it's to do with information. That quantum physics is liberating in the sense that I can always get that I can always get more information. Remember, I was talking about a finite information in the universe, 10 to 100 bits. Or your head, 10 to 42 bits. Imagine your life is super exciting, okay? And imagine you're gaining one bit uh, per 10 to minus uh, 40 seconds, okay? So you're a super exciting guy. You have a party non-stop, I don't know what else you're doing. You're, you're doing all sorts of things. And basically, within 100 seconds, you've saturated the whole of the memory in your head, okay? This would correspond to the information death of some sort. You couldn't do anything when you reach the maximally deep state inside your head. <coughs> but this principle will say no worries about it, because if you go into a different basis, you can start the whole thing all over again, because it would be erased in this different basis. So you can always get more information. Don't worry about your head being completely mixed, or the universe being completely mixed. It's all nice and easy, you can continue to, to, do, to do anything you like. So that would be the logic there. The logic of, of the other attempt is to, is to put in continuity as the required assumption. Okay? And that's going to somehow say, if I only have a bit, I cannot continuously go between 0 and 1. If I want to execute a continuous evolution between 0 and 1, I've got to have some states in between these guys. And various people have, uh, have worked on this idea. So it's not clear whether this is in, in any way related to this or not, but the motivation is I want to get the superposition principle. The first guy to do this was called Lambda, basically. And he, he imagined the following thing. He imagined the, the famous Gibbs paradox. And I will just repeat the Gibbs paradox, and, and it goes as follows. Um, and then I'll give you a, a bit nicer version more up-to-date version. I think people like Lucy and Hyde and various other people have these books who possibly can work on these ideas. And I think that's the state of the art. You know, if you want to derive physics from information, that's as best as we can do. Uh, probably it, it's, it's not good enough, obviously. But so basically, um, Gibbs paradox says, I've got, I've got a container with, with, with two different possible uh, configuration. Basically, I've got a gas on, on one side, and I've got a gas of some other atoms, possibly, on the other side. Okay? And I've got some initial entropy there. It's a famous paradox in classical statistical, classical thermodynamics. When people tell you indistinguishability of particles is a genuine quantum phenomenon, smack them in the head. It's not true. It's a classical phenomenon already. It exists there. It's classic. There's nothing quantum there. So it's, we are all sometimes overemphasizing the, the novelty of quantum mechanics. So what did Gibbs find out 150 years ago? He found out that if these guys, imagine now you remove this partition and the two gases mix. What Gibbs found out is that basically, as they mix and they reach the maximum entropy state, the final entropy, okay, is in fact in this case twice as big as the initial entropy. Why? It goes basically increases by 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 log of the of the twice of doubling the volume in this case. And the logic is as follows: Look at this guy. It's confined to half of the box, okay, but ultimately it spreads across the whole box, okay. So whatever is the initial uh, the initial um, the initial volume, the final volume is twice as much as that. So my, my, my change in entropy has got to be this much, and I, per particle, I've got n times that. And the same now for the other guy. It's confined to half the volume, now it expands to the whole volume, and I've got twice. So basically, whatever is the initial entropy, the final one is something like n times log uh, 2. 
it increases by a, by a large amount. Because I've got most possible states. It's the same logic as Boltzmann's, log, log of the number of possible configurations. And now Gibbs says something weird happens now. If I have the same gas on both sides, how does nature know whether the two gases are the same or not? I have no idea. It shouldn't know. Okay? If I have the same gas on both sides, then nothing happens. No entropy increases. Because when I remove it, it's exactly the same configuration. It's already maximal in the That's called Gibbs paradox. It's a big deal for these guys. They couldn't solve it. So if I have the same gas, then basically SF is the same as S input. No extra entropy increase. Okay? So who knows whether the particles are the same or not? So you see distinguishability, indistinguishability matters in classical physics. Um, Lambda said this is a little bit weird. It's all or nothing. So here is Lambda's logic about superpositions. Lambda's principle would be nature cannot be discontinuous. It makes no sense for anything in nature to be discontinuous. We talked about it a little bit before. So Lambda would say, if they're completely different, I've got this unit, log 2 increase. If they're not, if they're the same, I've got 0. So it's either 0 or log 2. Why not something between these two values? Now you can already see what he's doing. He's going to introduce partial indistinguishability between the atoms of the gas. One way of doing that is simply to say they are the same atoms, but I'm going to polarize them differently. I'm going to put the spin of this guy in, in the direction up, this guy in the direction down. Now they're completely distinguishable. But if I move them closer to each other, I can span to make the entropy increase anything I like. But it requires a superposition. You like the idea. I like it a lot. 60 years old. So basically it says it cannot be discontinuous, and if you don't believe in, in discontinuity in nature, you've got to have superpositions of states. It's a very powerful argument. Incomplete, he was a physicist, this, you know. He wouldn't really bite in the ultimate analysis, but it's a beautiful idea. Okay. Related to, to information as well, that's why it's nice. Now, what's the modern version this argument was resurrected, so to speak, uh, some uh, uh, maybe uh, five, six years ago uh, in a different format. And it goes like this. Um, so, and I think this genuinely is the best we can do. And if you don't like it, then um, yeah, I don't know what. <laughs> don't attend my last uh, lecture in my last week. I have no idea. Basically, it really is the closest we can come to deriving quantum uh, mechanics from, from something else. Um, this argument says, uh, says like this. What is the minimum I, can, I, I have to assume? So this, this, this argument is really, you sit in a chair in some nice uh, tobacco shop, you're smoking a cigar, you have a single malt whiskey on your side, you're sipping the whiskey and you're thinking, what kind of world do I have around me? Okay, you're doing no experiments, the ancient Greek style, okay? And you're saying, Okay, let me, let me make some sense of this. What should I start with? What should be my primitives? How do they behave? And so on. And amazingly enough, after an hour and a half, you will come up with quantum mechanics. Okay, you probably would have finished your cigars and whiskeys. But that's what I want to tell you now. But just from your head. Okay, so. You, you observe, and it's a fact of life, that we have different things happening in this universe. It's just a given fact. We can't do much about it. I'm not trying to explain why things happen in this universe. I can't explain that. I only want to explain the laws that connect one change and one observation with another. So I'm, I'm taking it as given that certain things occur with different uh, probabilities. So basically, now you give me states of your system, whatever you call them. Forget about quantum mechanical states. These are just the states is, I call them states because they are similar to the states in, in physics in general, but think of them that they don't have to be orthogonal, they don't have to be indistinguishable or anything like that. All I want is you to tell me that certain things can happen. There are n different things that can happen in this universe. Okay, this chair can be red, you know, we can do one thing, we can do another thing. Anything that is different to the, to the previous state is fine. And you just give me these guys, okay? So here are things that can happen. And these will be different states. Like I said, you don't have to bother whether they're fully distinguishable or not. 
that doesn't matter. Here is a photon, H power is 45, I don't care. What I want you to do is just to observe the frequencies with which these different configurations come up. And this is, of course, what we always do, so there is no mystery about it. So this is going to be a little bit like classical statistical mechanics. But I don't even introduce the phase, space, or whatever other. I don't need these things. I just have to just give me what are the things that you want to describe. And after some time, presumably I observe probabilities. You can see already that people who like many worlds are going to smile and say, look, your assumption is wrong. There are no probabilities in this universe. But let's assume that there are probabilities in this universe. So basically, this guy somehow comes up with this probability, this guy with this, and so on, OK? So there is no, you know, I, really anything that classifies as something that you can recognize and then do over and over again to get the probability qualifies for this. And I think the whole of science is just like that. I'm just capturing anything you do. So I can't be more general than that. I'm not making any final assumptions. And now what you say is, all I want from my laws of physics is to tell me how this evolves in time. Remember I spoke about the laws of physics being a kind of catalog, um, that, that these guys' states being catalogs of information, and the laws of physics telling me how to move from catalog A to catalog B. Again, to anyone with any uh, knowledge of mathematics, it will be clear that I need some kind of matrix to move this guy into the next set of problems. So, whatever is the next set of probabilities, I'm not even questioning what, what it is that you are observing. They're just changing in time. Some of them may not change in time. It makes no difference to me whatsoever. As soon as you are telling me that you have one description at one time and you want to be deriving another description, I know that I've got to write it as a matrix, as an M by N matrix. Okay? And this matrix has a, an extra feature that is a stochastic matrix because you want to conserve probability, presumably. This is all that can happen to you. If you discover more things happen, you just add them to your list. Never mind. They didn't happen before. They have zero probability. It's all nice and consistent within this. <coughs> and this is all great. And now you have an extra assumption, and that's the one giving you quantum mechanics. In fact, that's the one telling you that this is not the right thing to do. And that's interesting. So, um, and here is the assumption. What I'm going to ask now is that I'm going to be moving from time t to time t prime to time t second, and so on. The assumption is the same continuity assumption now as that I used here. So what I want to assume is that I can always subdivide things as much as I like. This may not be true. So this, you can see this is the tricky assumption that's going to differentiate. So if you give me an evolution between t and t prime, you give me a matrix, then I can always stop somewhere here in the middle, tm. And I can always write my big matrix, stochastic matrix, as a product of the matrix taking me between t and tm, and another tm and t prime. So the evolution between t and t prime, so whatever law you give me connecting two of these guys, I can always presumably say, well, what, what if I ask you halfway through? What if I stop my evolution and ask you halfway through? And if you, and now, I presumably would like the same theory to capture that. I don't want to have another theory that does, that does this guy. And interestingly enough, if this is your assumption, you can no longer maintain probabilities. And you can no longer ma maintain uh, stochastic matrices. That's the assumption that kills it. Why? Here's a simple example. Imagine your catalog of information only contains two states. And imagine that you are in the state one to start with. Okay? Coin pointing heads. You flip the coin, you get tails. So after some time, at T I'm in the state heads, and after some time I go into the state tails. And all of us know the matrix that does this. Okay? It's like a sigma X matrix. That's also a classical stochastic matrix. There are no complex numbers there. It's a nice matrix, okay? Nice, normal, classical, Newtonian, and so on. And now you ask yourself, what if I stop this guy halfway through? If I ask for continuity, I should be able to stop the evolution halfway through this guy and ask, what does it mean to have a, this is like a not gate. 
But what I'm really asking is, is for a square root of an odd gate. Okay. And actually, you know what a square root of an odd gate is. It's a Hadamard gate. It's, it's, it's a, it's a, there are imaginary numbers there. Why do I know that? Because if I have an interferometer, okay, so I'm really doing I'm really doing the basic quantum physics now, but I'm just showing you how it comes from that assumption. If I have an, a basic interferometer, and if I label this input as input zero, okay, and if I label this output as the output one, this is output zero, this is input one. All this network does is a not gate. Okay? This box here. takes me from 0 to 1 and from 1 to 0 as a box. That's my guy here. But I know that I can open the box and I want to stop the evolution halfway through. What's the state? The state is that this is going into 0 plus i 1. Here we go. Complex numbers. I cannot get away from complex numbers if I ask for continuity. It's just as simple as that. Okay? This is already after the first glass of whiskey and barely having smoked one, one Romeo and Juliet Cuban cigar. Okay? I've already got quantum mechanics. And I have to think a little bit, does this make sense? But actually it does. So if, if you really so the only two assumptions are I have probabilities and I want to predict how they move. Second assumption is I want exactly the same evolution to be holding between any two instances of time. And this is a natural assumption. I mean, why should I be evolving differently for the first five seconds and then another? Evolve? It just makes no sense in this universe. It just wouldn't make sense to have different evolutions. Okay? And if you, if that's the only thing you require, effectively, mathematically, what you're requiring me to do is to invent a gate that's a square root of a not gate. But this is not a stochastic matrix. It cannot be written as a stochastic classical. Um, i.e. as complex numbers. Okay. And you know that these guys are something like 1 over root to 1 i minus i 1 or something like that, whatever it is, the SU2, okay? So, so the logic is that according to this school of thought, which I think is an interesting uh, school of thought, all that discriminates quantum from classical mechanics is really the fact that the bits are discrete. And you are only talking about ever zero or one bit. You are never talking about anything in between. Whereas quantum mechanically, you have this, you have this freedom to stop the evolution and to say, basically, it doesn't even make sense to stop the evolution halfway through. It has no meaning. It's either in the state zero or in the state one. But if you require this flexibility, then somehow, Quantum mechanics is the most natural theory that arises. I'm not saying this is the only one. You can probably fix this in, in other ways, but this is the one that somehow seems like the easiest one to come up with immediately. Maybe you can have even more general numbers here, like quaternions, octonions, whatever else you can have. I'm not denying that. <coughs> but somehow this seems to be the first one that you should that you should invent. Um, so in, in many ways, Laplace, who pioneered the, the theory of probability should have really also come up with quantum mechanics. I think it's an exaggeration, but he could have, could have come up with quantum mechanics. Um, some of these topics I will touch upon in the last week. Let me just say what I will do in the last week so you know what's going on. I think Marcelo will also send an email around. I have five lectures, and I'm going to be doing something like um, many body um, entanglement. In the first one, I'll try to say a little bit about theory plus experiment. In the second one, I'll try to talk about cluster states. The third one is going to be a little bit more interesting because the department here also asked for a lecture that everyone else can understand. And I think this one qualifies better than anyone. It's still within the con context of many body physics, but I'll tell you something about quantum biology. So what I want to talk about is, is whether birds use entanglement to detect the magnetic field of our planet. The answer is yes, of course. Um, that's a really exciting topic.
uh, one nature paper after another, by the way. Photosynthesis also goes there. The fourth topic, I, I'd like to talk a little bit about complexity. How to define complexity in general. There are many different definitions, like Shana's entropy, Kolmogorov entropy, and so on. I'd like to talk about an, another complexity that makes more sense to a physicist than the other definitions. Uh, probably I'll talk a little bit about, about this code here as well, if I get a chance. And then the fifth lecture would be something to Maxwell's, Maxwell's D. Um, and here I'd like to talk about this general interconnectedness that the laws of physics and information and thermodynamics, and I'd like to combine them all into one. So in some sense, that lecture is going to be in spirit similar to, to what I've talked about today. Stop here. And questions as usual. I really like that idea that you show us, but I don't understand why you ask for a complex numbers in the square root of not. Why just not the Hadamard gate test? You can do a Hadamard as well, yeah. So you can now stop. You can now stop even at another point, and you will see that at some stage you will need a complex number if you divide it into three and so on. Yeah, I agree. With with the root not, you can put just one minus one minus one one, whatever, and you will get something. Like that. Yeah, but not for for more general. Dissection of these guys. You will in general need some kind of. Uh, of the For example, yeah. Okay. For example. But why do we assume, assume the, the use of matrices to give you the evolution and not some general function of the, 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 the initial state you have? Because anything, anything, if all you're giving me are two sets of probability distributions. Yes. That any evolution can be written as a as an n by n matrix. There is no other way to write this guy. Anything that moves this into this is by definition. It's almost by definition. That's the most general functional way you can represent. It's very interesting. Well, you have a nonlinear function of probability. You have a nonlinear. You're right. Yeah. That could be that could be an extension. You're right. You could be squaring them and things like that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. So, uh, this kind of, I, I really didn't like motion, this kind of derivation of quantum mechanics. Because I believe that the most sensitive thing of doing this kind of thing would assume uh, hidden values or something like that. Yes. Not considering all the probabilities. There are some intermediate points that are not accessible for you. I don't know, I, because you say from Laplace to think about that, but I, I believe you would think and uh, I don't know why quantum mechanics. There are other possibilities that are much simpler. <laughs> You're right. This logic, this logic actually says that we don't need entanglement to expose the whole weirdness of quantum mechanics. The departure already is with the, with this with the, with this you know ability to have a superposition of states. So then locality has nothing to do with it. Hidden variables are not even in the frame of this. No, but I'm telling, for example, to change from 1 to 0, you use an example of a coin. But we know that a coin changes from 1 to 0, it's making it. Absolutely. There are some other things that you are not, are not considering. Absolutely. And it's artificial in a point of view to change from 0 to 1. Well, another way of saying what you're saying, I think, is, is there's an even better way of saying that, actually which is to, to say that why do you associate bits with classical physics? Why not an analog version of classical physics? And then all of your questions are, that, that's why, of course, this is not a proof that I, that I, that I must have quantum, but it comes as close as possible to that. That's why I was in, sure. Electrodynamics, classical electrodynamics, everything is nice and continuous. States move continuously. So it satisfies all of these things, I would say. And yet, it's a classical theory. So you're absolutely right. So it's because I'm forcing here a discrete value of a bit. And you can say, yes, you're making it too restrictive. It really should be continuous. Sure. Yeah. Then yeah, you cannot avoid that criticism. Even though when you go to the lab and you choose certain physical systems, they present a, a bit-like response anyway. No matter which direction you, you choose to measure, they always yes. give you either one or zero. So now we have a beautiful Socratic story 
is developing in front of us that we should write for American Journal of Physics. Basically, exactly like that. And we can go ad infinitum back and forth. It's exactly what you're saying. We need a guy called Simpleton. That would be me, probably. This is Galilea. I think I'm not surprised. And we need another guy who is a little bit more complicated, I suppose. And I think we go like that. Absolutely. So even electromagnetic field, you don't get infinitely many bits. You get a click in your detector or not click. And now you're back to probabilities. And you do that in a finite duration of time. And you believe that if you speed it up, you can always do it faster and faster. So it's no longer clear whether this already implies that you need to quantize even electromagnetic field. I don't know. But I think this could, this could be developed very nicely. There are a lot more effects with the heavy particle base scans. Uh, how can we describe the scribe who can see the time we can do scans? If I scatter particles, right, then of course you have to be able to handle each of the outputs <coughs> of your scattering. Depends what you mean by entanglement and to what degree you'd like to confirm entanglement. Um, one way could be just to rescatter them back and see whether they bunch or anti-bunch, as I was describing. But if you want to convince the die-hard uh, skeptics, then you should really be making local operations and measurements on each of these particles, doing some kind of Bell's inequalities to eliminate even any communication between them. Because if you recombine your particles at one interferometer, then people will say, you're not really you're not doing anything about not locality because the particles are now in the same point of space-time. So there could be some hidden variables communicating between them. It's a very tricky issue. So that, what you are saying would be like witnessing entanglement, combining them back. In that case, I don't care about uh, locality, reality, and all of these things. But if you start to care about that aspect as well, then you have to be, then it's much, much harder to do these experiments. It's very hard. About this uh, second postulate uh, uh, here that you can always get more. Like, this is not against the solution to the Maxwell theorem. Like uh, those, this solution is that uh, you are in fact uh, having a lot of uh, information in demos uh, rank, and that at, at some point you need to erase this uh, information. And this is exactly erasing now, going into another basis, right? This is, this is erasing. I would say this is, you can think of it like that, yeah. So when you measure in a different basis, you are increasing uh, entropy? Yes, you're adding another bit to that. And if you ask yourself why, where, then because measuring means that you've coupled it to something else that's extracted the value. So I'm not, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not sufficient to just talk about the system. So you measure a system in one basis and you record that in another qubit. Okay? And then you measure it in, in complementary basis, but you have to also record that in, a, in yet another qubit. And these are the guys that are increasing your entropy. The rest of the universe gets. So your system, no problem, it still always stays at one bit in different bases, but the rest of the universe now is like your memory, which in a way tags all of these things, and you cannot avoid that. At some stage you always need some fewer qubits to bring them to as, as, a, as your writing path, if you like. So you, you could replace the second postulate in a less spectacular array, you can always erase the formation. Yes, instead of, instead of saying you can always create information, you can then say I can always erase information. You're right, yeah. yeah. Although then, what, you're, what could happen if you say something like that, is that someone could say, ah, but I can do that without changing the basis, by simply flipping the guy randomly without telling you what I did. So in a way, you tell me you have one unit of information because you know it's pointing in the state up, I come along and I say, oh, I'm going to do this or I'm not going to do it and I'm not going to tell you what. And in a way, classical now, probabilities can, can erase information. If this is what you call erasing information, you have to be careful to define. But 
that, that's the tricky bit there. So in some sense here you are erasing information but creating maximum in another basis, but the previous one you are erasing. So that's the way it is defined. It is ill defined. Yeah. Even the first postulate, like I said, is almost like a tautology. It's not really an axiom. It's a... you, 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 just, you, you have just said you have to take the rest of the universal account and it's not going Absolutely. to Absolutely. Absolutely. This is what you find with these postulates, that you are really trying to start from nothing and make no assumptions. But when you think about it a bit more deeply, you are somehow assuming some other things as well. And these are the dangerous ones. And I've been through X number of these proposals where at some stage the guy has assumed the vector space. That's it. Once you have that, you go quantum mechanics. You will no longer need to talk. So it's very difficult, like, walking between these two lines and avoiding any other preconceptions that we already have. Okay, have a good break. <laughs>